There are a lot of reasons why people leave a church community. They didn't put my name in the bulletin when I gave X. I don't like the new preacher or the current one or what I hear out of the pulpit, so I'm leaving. The church teaching in Sunday school on this just doesn't fly, so we're out of here. Just ask our brothers and sisters in the United Methodist Church today in the battle over LGBTQ, whether made and affirmed in the image of God, an issue of inclusion, or an issue of naming sin and a sinful lifestyle, and you have people choosing sides of the aisle, and people who once have worshiped shoulder to shoulder, prayed together, gone through difficult times together, and supported one another, now say, You are no longer part of me. We do not belong to the same God, the same gospel. We don't read scripture in the same way anymore, so I'm done. In the Johannine community, the Gospel of John, the three epistles, we have this text that was read today from the first letter of John. And His faith community is undergoing a split. If you read the five chapters of the book, it says in chapter two, many have left us. How many? How big is this community? Is it five people, two people? Is it half the church? We don't know. What we do know is that there's enough energy in this letter to be equal parts pastoral care to those who remain, who are worried. Maybe those people who left have something, you know, maybe they have a legitimate reason who are feeling insecure, feeling anxious, feeling fearful, worried about the future, and also equal parts exhortation of how they should live moving forward. Church member Brett Johnson, and I hope I do his his thoughts justice, during our inter-a-week Bible study, Church Without Borders said, you know, sometimes, whether it's at the conference level or the local church level, we get into these fights or disagreements in the church, so much so that we move from the things we're called to be, the way that we've been light in the community, the missions of the church, and the energy becomes the fight that defines who we are. Virginia Johnson, who has spent about eight decades in this church, said, you know what I tell people when they get upset when something bothers them in the church? I tell them, wait 10 years. And it'll all work out. Stick with each other. (laughs) It seems flippant, but it is a beautiful sentiment. When the going gets tough, stick with each other. Pastor Michelle, as we were talking about this text this week, reminded me of uh, an early story in our history. Plymouth Congregational Church, Plymouth, Massachusetts, easy for me to say, where the Mayflower landed, right? Congregationalists for the first time. They built a church community. They have a plaque on the wall. We may have some pictures for it. I'm not sure. No, we don't. We're having all kinds of sound and light issues today. That's all right. But a picture in your mind. So they built this congregational church. On the front, it has this beautiful plaque saying, the original you know, of KFC, the original recipe of congregationalism, the very first congregational church in America. But they had a, a disagreement within that church. Over time, there were some that said, we're not comfortable with this Trinitarian language, the equality of son and spirit to God, the idea that we have one God, so they became Unitarians or were Unitarians in their belief. So they formed what is known today as a Unitarian church. But they moved, guess where they moved? Right across the street, literally, right across the street, small town, Plymouth, Massachusetts. They built their church, and on their sign out front, it says, we are the true keepers who saw rightly. So imagine this. You're worshiping at the congregational church. You step out the front door, and there's a sign that basically says, you guys were wrong as you look across the street. Or if you're at the Unitarian Church, you have an equal sign outside saying, we were the first and the right ones. Right across a block from each other, saying, 
We're right, you're wrong. We talked a little bit about gatekeeping last week, thinking about who's in, who's out, a role that is Christ's. But we get so preoccupied in our neighbor's business And I wonder, I don't wonder very much because I hear it often, those outside the church saying, wow, Jesus we understand. Amazing messages and teachings, embodiment of love, but when we look at Jesus' followers, maybe the sentiments of Mahatma Gandhi, I love the teachings of Jesus, Gandhi said, but the way they're expressed through his followers, I just can't understand. Wow. Wow. So what has happened in this community that the epistle is speaking to? It says there are some who have left, who have not belonged to us, maybe since the beginning. And what marks in, the, in this writer's eyes the reason they haven't belonged? A couple of things that we get from the letter. One, they valued a worldly or earthly life driven by material things or less about Jesus than other things. So they maybe weren't really genuine in their hearts. How does a human being determine that? Or, more pointedly, they don't recognize Christ's revelation as being uh, the love of God embodied incarnate in the world. And so they, this is a time, remember, much later in church history where you have a lot of Gnostic groups, some saying, well, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He's an illusion of his death, or he's just a human being who is a prophetic voice versus others who are saying he's only divine, there's no humanity in him. And so this is community defining itself over and above against some of these other beliefs. But at the core of it, the writer says, you love each other. Now we talk about love in the church all the time. We sing about love but this is a very specific kind of love. And the writer of the letter uses two examples. He says, negatively, don't be like Cain. He goes back to the book of Genesis and he says, and he quotes Genesis and saying, when God meets Cain, God says to Cain, why are you so upset about what your brother is offering in worship to me? I say this with my kids when they tattle on their sisters. You don't worry about what your sister is doing. You worry about you. What they're doing and their consequences is between me and them, not between you and them and me. And so the letter writer's bringing up this example of Cain. And God saying basically, if you go back to that Genesis text, he tells Cain, If you are right in your heart, will not our relationship, Cain and God's, be a good one? But sin is lurking at your doorstep. In your jealousy, your pride, your anger, your envy of your brother Abel, sin is lurking at your doorstep and it is changing your heart. Hatred for your brother, envy or jealousy is starting to fuel your thoughts Be careful, Cain. And what does Cain do? Just a verse later, he goes, plots to kill his brother, and does so. And so in how he sees his brother, his worry, his fear, his looking at his brother and thinking something less about his brother than him, he lashes out and attacks that which is different from him. On the converse, he says, this epistle writer, love like Jesus, who, when people are plotting against him, remember Jesus heals on the Sabbath, man with a withered hand, Jesus hears people mumbling in the background and says, how is it? He doesn't doesn't say, I'm done with you. He doesn't say, your beliefs about the Sabbath are wrong, and so you need to leave this synagogue. He says, hey, he engages them. If your mule or donkey falls in a ditch and it's wounded, are you going to wait till the day after the Sabbath to help it? No. 
You're going to help your animal because you realize in the moment there is a crisis, there's a need, there's a moment for healing or restoration, and you're going to act. So why, because I have done this on the Sabbath, are you grumbling, are you angry because I've helped your brother find healing and restoration and life-giving good news, but you're so caught up in your rule-keeping, your black and white world, with us or against us, you broke this commandment. No, Jesus continues to engage them. When the Pharisees chastise him for being a heathen, like we talked about last week when he heals the man who's born blind in John's gospel. When people get up early in the morning to arrest him on trumped up charges, when people drive spikes through his nails, he doesn't say, I disown you. He doesn't say you're wrong. He says, forgive them, Father. He offers them grace. In love, he steps into the places of disparity and difference, and he continues to love them. He doesn't say, I love what you're doing. He doesn't say, I love how you've twisted good news or life-giving faith into something that is crippling. He loves them in it. The epistle writer gets this right in saying, we are called to love each other in Christ-like ways. Now, here's the rub. This is really tough to do. When I was in a former church in Michigan, I had church members who were going through some crisis and was with them through those financial and spiritual crisis, very close to them for the seven years that I served there. Recently, <clears throat> I've watched their Facebook and social media posts get more and more in Christian zeal, more and more narrow. And I saw their posts from January 5th and 6th as they were standing outside the Capitol. Now they didn't break any windows and they didn't charge or shoot any weapons. <clears throat> but I struggled deeply we have stood shoulder to shoulder. We have served together in Christ. And yet, how you have depicted Christ in this moment to the world is not how I see Christ. Maybe some of you have had similar experiences. Or somebody says your church is wrong. Or your expression of faith is not the right expression of faith. Your reading of scripture is not the right reading of scripture. I read something recently and, and then heard a speech by now deceased rabbi Edwin Freeman in his writing The Myth of the Shiska, where very much like C.S. Lewis, Friedman, um, Lewis's screw tape letters, Friedman uh, fictionally has an interview with the devil. And as he's asking questions of the devil, the devil replies just how he intends to get human beings to turn on one another and on God. And the devil says, the greatest scheme I have is this sense of community, of people coming together, except I'm going to mess with this idea of unity and community by bringing them together around their fears and their anxieties. Now, he wrote this about 25 years ago. And as they gather around their fears and anxieties, they'll begin to blame others who are outside of their circle. They'll begin to look at the failures and shortcomings of others driven by their fears and insecurities. And as they do so, more and more driven by these fears, they'll lose their sense of self that they had before they gathered in community around that fear. They'll lose their integrity, the things they valued, and the things they stood for, so that there's a sense of belonging around that fear and that blaming. And in doing so, here's the beautiful part Satan says in it, in doing so, 
not only do they lose their sense of self, but the more and more fear drives them, the darker they become, and they will do things together as a herd that they never would have imagined they would do on their own before their fear drove them together. He goes on to say, and I love this part because I'm a huge Star Wars junkie. Remember that Darth Vader was once a Jedi Knight. Somebody who was committed to the truth, to defending the alien and the marginalized, and being a protector of the galaxy. But when Vader started to look at, in his fears, the failures and shortcomings of others and started to blame them for the things that were wrong, he determined that he would use his power to fix them. And he moved from light to shadow. Driven no more by love and compassion, but by fear and hatred of his brothers and sisters with whom he now, with whom he once stood, but now disagreed with. Hmm. My little brothers and sisters, my children, let us love not in word and speech, not in the surface alone, but in truth and in action. In other words, we use this expression a lot. It can't just be lip surface. You have to walk the walk. So what we say and do or teach or preach in here has to be a daily life expression when we walk out the doors so that we're not one person inside the church building and somebody else to anybody else we meet in any other facet of our lives. It is not this idea that church or faith is a part of my life. God wants the whole thing. But we kind of compartmentalize it, don't we? Well, I've got my Sunday morning life, and then Monday through Saturday, well, it's all no holds bar, whatever. No. So in this time, a great upheaval of us versus them, left and right, conservative, liberal, I don't care what labels you use. How would Jesus love the people you and I struggle to love? Is that hard for us to answer? What do you say, well, you're not on my, you don't vote the same way I do? Of course not. What do you say, you don't see the Bible the same way I do? There are plenty of people in Jesus' day who didn't think he saw the Bible right. Did he give up on them? Of course not. Not everybody circled around the cross holding hands and singing Kumbaya when Christ was crucified. Did he give up on them? This is the tough part of being a person of faith. world says we can give up on each other at the drop of a hat. Just walk away, defriend them. Christ says, find a way to love through hearts of stone. Find a way to love when people insult you. I think I heard this once, persecute you. Say terrible things about you. Still be salt and light. Well, I prefer the Hallmark kind of love. You know, balloons and cards and such. No. Christ like love, not consumed by anger or hatred, says, I'm going to be the person God has called me to be, convicted of what I believe. Not some cowardly love, but that shares that love in a way that continues to be who it's called to be, but doesn't give up on its brother and sister and those beyond the walls. Maybe then, good news 
from the church would really feel like good news that is given for all people. My ethics professor in seminary had a poster on the wall, and I'll never forget it. He said, I have a modest proposal for peace. Let Christians in the world agree not to insult and kill one another. Let's start there. And I will admit, though it sounds beautiful, and I love the saying, it is really tough. Because I know in some of my most painful moments have been fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who said, your love of Jesus, your expression of Christ doesn't count because it's not like mine. Maybe you've never experienced that. I hope you haven't. But I don't think that's the world we live in. As I ask myself, how do you love? Is it a Cain-like love that loves in the moment, but then, uh, uh, or is it Christ-like love? I don't think we ever fully arrive at the Christ-like love. I think it's always a work in progress, a daily effort. But I hope you'll join me in working on it so that when we leave this place and even within it, whomever we meet, in person, online, at work, at home, in our families, as much as the writer Paul as much as it depends upon us, the way we love will live at peace and harmony with our brothers and sisters. We can't ever determine how somebody's gonna react. Our salvation does not depend on whether somebody else functions well or does not. All we can do is be who we're called to be before Christ and to lead always, always, always lead with love.